So Janet Traub and Jim Toppin will be presenting today. Uh, before we go there, I'll hand uh, you, this off to uh, Barry McEwen, who is the president of the Toledo Naturalist Association. And he is going to give a few words and introduce our presenters. Welcome, Barry. Thank you, John. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, this is the October program meeting of the Toledo Naturalist Association. I want to really thank John for all the work he's done on making these Zoom meetings possible and doing all the technical work. As we said last time, the pandemic has had a real effect on this uh, program start this year. We've had smaller field trips that uh, people need to make reservations. We have the Zoom program meetings, and next month in November, we'll have our Zoom banquet. Uh, the uh, and, and this year, there will also be no TNA uh, Naturalist of the Year. But uh, we ask you to be, please bear with us as we go through these trying times. And hopefully, we'll be able to meet again in person in the, the not-too-distant future. I want to thank Chris Mancy and uh, the uh, article contributors for our monthly newsletter, both in the uh, print and electronic versions. And to thank uh, Eric Durbin and Kim Smith. And again, John, for keeping our various uh, communications uh, formats going for people. So again, keep checking the website and Facebook for current information because it does change and that's the best place to go to see what's the most current things. Our upcoming field trips uh, are posted on the, on the website, but the banquet will be November 19th at 7 p.m. Our program will be tiger beetles, speed demons of the insect world. And that will be an opportunity for you to enjoy the banquet from the privacy of your own home. You can have any type of food you want, uh, just order off your individual menus. And then after the presentation for the TNA members, uh, we will do our annual meeting with the election of officers and of some basic reports. So. Hope you can all join us in November. And then in December, our, we have our various Christmas bird counts. And again, that will be listed in the TNA newsletter and on the website. So without any real further ado, I would like to introduce our, our two speakers for tonight, uh, Janet Traub and, and Jim Tobin. And I think some of you got here earlier and you probably saw a little bio on them. Uh, but Janet has been a stewardship volunteer uh, with Kitty Todd Nature Preserve. They, they've been involved with Nature Conservancy. Uh, they've participated uh, with the American, I probably won't get this right because I haven't had Latin since high school, oh. Biological and Lichenological Society and the Ohio Moss and Lichen Association. Uh, Janet worked in land survey business and most recently has been studying satellite, satellite sensing uh, images of Lake Erie uh, to uh, reveal information about the lake and how that's uh, been affected health-wise and how satellites can help with that. She said she's now uh, calmly waiting out the pandemic at Catawba Island and needs a little more exercise. So I guess she'll be getting out looking at more lichens. <laughs> and then Jim uh, was a translator of Russian and French in areas of manufacturing and public health. He tutored part-time at Owens College. He's the author of Stories of the Soviet Anti-Plague System, an occasional paper of the Monterey Institute of International Studies. And since the late 1980s, he and Janet have volunteered for uh, invasive plant control, seed collecting, prescribed burns, and uh, a number of different things for the Nature Conservancy, both in Ohio and Michigan, and maybe a few other places as well. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Janet and Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Well, we kind of try to get our slideshow going, see how it goes here. This looks like it. All right. That didn't work. Okay. Try this. Okay, that sounds good. Well, 
Barry and John have kind of given our whole show for us, so <laughs> I guess I don't know. Uh, but we are Janet and Jim, and uh, you see on this slide the uh, URL for Ohio Moss Lichen dot org and that has, just has an amazing amount of content and however much you want to learn it'll really get going <laughs> and most all of it was done by our uh, fellow member uh, bob clips who was uh, just recently retired from ohio state now here is a picture of isidia so you have seen it lately this is it right here the smaller little bumps are features on the surface of certain lichens that are called Lysidia, and we'll get into the particulars of why those are called that. And here comes Bob Clips. We're using so many of his photos today that we thought we'd give you a good look at him. He's really slow because he stops and takes pictures of everything. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, so here's uh, another close-up of some Isidia and so those are the bumps on, on top of the surface. Um, and uh, if you notice a particularity there, on the sides, they're the same color as the cortex, which is the outer layer of the, of the, of the uh, thallus, which is the plant. Uh, there's another kind that we're going to talk also about soridia, which are, come from openings in the plants. And they're kind of some of the material that's inside of the plant. But the, the isidia actually grow on off the surface and they have that same color as the, the, uh, the rest of the surface. And they're named after a, a genus of corals called uh, Isis. And the reason why is sometimes these Isidia are branched like a, like a coral, so. so. Yeah, a little bit of a <laughs> coral similarity. <laughs> this is obviously, we're gonna run you through where to look. <laughs> So the first uh, place to look is on any rock surface. Of course, we don't have too much bedrock around here, but fortunately we have the glaciers who left uh, all kinds of erratics all over the place. And we also have people who have uh, poured concrete everywhere. So uh, there are actually a lot of uh, different kinds of rocks to look at. And uh, you'll find that the reason the substrates are so important is you'll find different things on different substrates. So you'll look, uh, each time you look at a different item, like a rock or a tree trunk, you're likely going to see different things. Expecting different <laughs> species. Uh, one, one place to find a lot of rocks, and they do some favor calcareous and some favor uh, silicious rocks, is you go to the Sawyer Quarry Park, and you go around the big quarry up in the northeast corner, there's a lot of boulders that they've hauled away before they started taking off the overburden. So those boulders over there do have a lot of uh, different lichen. And this is what you got to do. You have to hold the lens close to your eye. Don't try to hold it like in the Sherlock Holmes picture. So you got to get right down in there to have a good look. They're more fun up close. And here's some things that you might see. Smoky eyed boulder lichen. That's going to be in the show a lot because it has a fun name. And actually, that's a good point. Uh, they've tried to assign common names to all lichens, but most of them are pretty boring and lame, obviously, except for this one. Uh, there's a few good ones here and there, but so as a result, most times when people are talking about lichens, you use the, the scientific name, which can get a little tedious for people, but it's really the only way to, to communicate on them. But uh, Again, there's been a lot of attempts at common names, and this is one of the successful ones. And here's another substrate. These are downed logs. Mm. And you see that kind of gray green. It's, uh, is it? It's a cladonia. Cladonia, <laughs> maybe coniocrea. It's got those little <laughs> pointy things standing up. Mm -hmm. If you look up and down the log. Yeah, down the lower left-hand corner, there's some of those. But, uh, but again, you need a nice close look, but, uh, so another substrate is tree trunks. And of course, tree trunks fall over and become logs, but eventually when you see the older logs, you'll find different things starting to grow on them. Uh, but the yellow one here is Candelaria con color. And the dark gray green one, I don't know what it is. We're not quite sure. <laughs> so uh, that would require taking a piece of it and taking a better look. But uh, 
Now, Candelaria concolor is interesting because it's very uh, resistant to air pollution. So you'll see that in downtown, in the middle of town, right next to highways, uh, you know, any place where even uh, quite polluted areas, you'll, you'll see Candelaria concolor. It's very small. Uh, those um, I city or the, uh, the thallus is probably just a quarter of an inch or uh, each one is, is very small, but. Uh, yeah, you can tell just from the <clears throat> tree bark, this is very close. Now here's another one here, uh, walnut tree down at the corner of the road. You see the tree, you notice it's a little yellowish cast and there it is. I'm pretty sure that's <laughs> Candelaria concolor. You see a little orangish thing down more by the label. That's probably a different lichen. <clears throat> yes. And here's a soil <laughs> substrate. So when you're out in the field, again, look for a, a bare spot of soil. You probably aren't likely to find lichens growing on lawns or really dense kind of grassy areas. You typically want a kind of a bare area uh, is, the, is the place to look. And that these pictures, a couple of these pictures were taken from Kitty Todd. So there is a, a, some of that reindeer lichen here on the soil. They say reindeer eat that. Here's another one, our, our twigs. One thing about lichens, uh, compared to mosses, lichen require a lot more sunlight. And so they really love the young twigs, the fruit trees, and uh, you'll have a big tree in your yard. It won't have any lichen on it, but you'll have a storm and an old branch will fall down from the top and it will, it will have lichen here. You can see here, it needs a little bit of water for that algae to get going. And so the lichens are a little bit bigger at every little node and branch. <laughs> and here's another one. And this one has a feature that you might see little circular disks on there. Jim will tell you about that. <clears throat> well, actually, Janet brought up the point about branches. So when you're out in the field, you also might look at branches that have recently fallen down and are just lying around because there's going to be a lot more light up at the top of the canopy. Now, eventually, when the branches fall, um, again, because of the light conditions and the humidity, those lichens eventually will just die out. But again, they could be thriving up at the top of the canopy, and you wouldn't really know it just from walking around until you see, um, until you see a branch that's, that's dropped down, which this brings up an interesting story. Ray Showman, who was uh, one of the, who is one of the authors of the Macro Lichens of Ohio, uh, lives down in Vinton County. He spent his uh, life uh, identifying lichens and doing air pollution studies. But one winter day, he had a flock of chickadees come through his yard, and they were making all kinds of racket. And uh, he went outside later on to uh, refill his bird feeder, and he noticed uh, some odd things in his yard that he hadn't seen before. Well, it turned out the chickadees apparently knocked off some lichens that were in the top of the tree, which happened to be a new state record. So uh, Ray actually found a new state record in his own backyard, <laughs> thanks to the chickadees. He knew what to look for, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Here's another substrate. There's actually a bunch of substrates. Notice there's even the seat on the left has some lichens growing right on the metal, the old rusty metal. Um, there's all kinds of things. There must be at least six or eight things on this own old grinding wheel. Again, when you walk by, it's a blotchy thing, but that's where your hand <laughs> lens makes it more fun for you. And uh, here's one boat cover lichen. <laughs> that's my own uh, kind of humble name for this. <laughs> but they, they'll pick something. They know what they want. But if it moves around very much, they don't do well. Here's a well-known one. For stones in Northwest Ohio, we often go to cemeteries. There is a problem recently that uh, people have tried to be so tidy, they get out and, and clean up the stones quite a bit. But if you keep looking, you will find some. So cemeteries are a really great place. Again, you'll see a lot of variety of rocks. You'll see some possibly sandstone, definitely marble and other things, uh, or granite. So you'll see different things on, on yeah, each kind a lot of stone. Of substrates and those were yeah the back uh, uh, yeah and that's uh, yeah there's at least three kinds there there's some black uh, uh, crustose lichen and then this uh, moon glow lichen dimelina um, 
And, but just uh, again, wander around in the cemetery for a few minutes and you'll, you'll see a variety of lichens there. In particular, this is one that uh, it does occur on branches and uh, tr twigs sometimes, but uh, it's very common on marble headstones. And if you notice the ends of the lobes uh, look kind of like they're sort of inflated or they look like kind of fists or something. So this is Fissia adscendens. And uh, again, most, uh, even though we don't have marble naturally around here, it finds it and uh, it's very common on the marble uh, cemetery headstones. Yeah, so when it when it get to the keying stage and it says looks like a fist in uh, I think probably Ray's book, this is what they're talking about. Fissia adscendens. Now here are uh, three basic ways that it, that their shapes are called, and these are all lichens because they have similar biologies. The the one on the left is leaf shapes or folios, so that's called a phallus with a big broad blob. It's not very much differentiated. It has lobes, and the middle one is fruticose, and it doesn't mean has apples or pears. Uh, the so it's kind of a surprising word. Yeah, the Latin word is frutex, which I always, for a long time, I was looking around trying to figure out why they were talking about fruit until I finally, somebody yeah. mentioned that it's... And we've just been looking at several of the crustose ones, and the <laughs> crustose are, are embedded right into the substrate. It'll be a, a tree bark or into a rock, and... Uh, the, mostly, maybe just expressed mainly with these apothecia, those round things, they look kind of like pa little pancakes or something. <laughs> so the basic difference then is the folios has a top and a bottom, and the bottom is resting on the substrate. The fruticose are, are more three-dimensional, so they don't really have a top and a bottom. And the crustose are, I guess the definition of a crustose lichen is it's absolutely impossible to get it off of the substrate. So without destroying the substrate. And so in order to collect those, you have to have a big hammer and a cold chisel and just knock a hunk off, so. That's how like lichenologists get bad names. <laughs> Here are some typical leaf-shaped folio swans. And you notice a variety of colors. A lot of uh, lichens are sort of grayish green, uh, light gray, uh, but there is a, some subtle variations. Obviously, the one on the very left is, is quite a bit darker. Uh, again, there are two lichens in that photo, and uh, this is a much, uh, the one on the right, obviously, a much lighter green. So you kind of uh, get used to the slight variations. Yeah, and... sometimes the color is going to be a tip off. <clears throat> and here's an example of the fruticose ones, uh, the Cladonia pixidata, which is commonly referred to as pixie cups. Pixie cup. It's nice to have a common name now and then. That's right. Really nice shot. And this another Cladonia, which um, and Cladonia, by the way, is a very large genus. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of species in it. There's a lot of ones that look quite a bit different, but they have a real similar um, have enough similarity that they're all really in the same genus. <clears throat> which brings up a point about using the uh, scientific names. So for instance, you have um, British soldier lichen, which a lot of people have heard of, the pixie cup that we just saw. There's a ladder lichen, there's a turban lichen. And what they all have in common is they're all cladonias. So using the common name, you kind of wouldn't get that connection that they're, they're all actually really closely related. <clears throat> oh, speaking of the- Another cladonia. <clears throat> it's like deer horn, I guess. <clears throat> cladonia cervicornis. <clears throat> And that's being held by uh, Ian Adams, a photographer from uh, Cuyahoga Falls, who uh, <clears throat> does a lot of nature photography. He came up here to Kitty Todd to uh, photograph some lichens. And in fact, that was one of the ones he really wanted to photograph. So Ooh, well, this we is found, some, uh, found some there. On this one here, uh, each little new uh, fruticose, not, not apothecia, but with the podesia, the little top comes right out of the middle. There's another one just like it where they come out from around the rim. So I don't know why they decide those things. 
Here's a really beautiful one. And, and Kim Smith just sent us an email that she had just seen this uh, British soldier liking herself just the other day. Yeah, it's really widespread. You don't just <clears throat> see it every time you're, you know, take a step, but it's it's really kind of all over. Sometimes it'll grow on logs, but a lot of times uh, pretty much more commonly on soil. This, this growth form and the kind of spindly one are, they're called fruticose, but you can see <clears throat> the kind of grade and it's not really bushy, but <clears throat> they just stop splitting them into groups, I guess. So they call it fruticose. So these are probably less than an inch tall. So just to give you a kind of <clears throat> feel for, for the size. Here's another uh, uh, watercolor image of the Cladonia cristatella British soldier by a famous painter, <clears throat> Beatrix Potter. She was a great watercolorist and she had uh, presented some work to uh, the, I don't know what you call it, Linnaeus Society in London, but she wasn't really accepted in her time. So she went on to uh, stories about bunnies and things. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a nice boulder lichen, and this isn't really Northwest Ohio, I'm sure, but it's really so pretty with all the different colors, so I put it in. This is crustose. Yeah, and there's probably, I would say, at least five or six different kinds yeah, on this black, one. Black, orange, yellow, two kinds of gray. Yep. So not too many people study the crustose ones. In fact, there's a lot that's not really known about them. In some cases, uh, they're not really clear about how many species there are um, in the United States, in North America. So they really have achieved, they have received a lot less attention. They, they really require a microscope, uh, 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 a compound microscope to really As Bob identify. Cliffs tell us, they're really not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't really gotten <laughs> into it too much. Now the, uh, the folios and, and fruticose lichens, you can, identify those just with a hand lens or a, a dissecting a microscope, but uh, these crustose ones here require... The crustose, just because you can't identify it doesn't mean they're not pretty. <clears throat> oh yeah, they're nice and looking. And here, here are the smoky-eyed uh, boulder-like, and you can see the little smoky eyes in the middle, and then it spreads <clears throat> out from there. And that's on a conglomerate, <clears throat> obviously. And each smoky eye has a kind of a darker ring around it, so... Yeah, dark outside a... ring. And this is one that you'll see really in the uh, very low light. So it's it's uh, it can be in the, really in the deep forest where you don't see necessarily a lot of lichens. So it doesn't doesn't really require as much sunlight as, as some of the other ones. This is just a review for you. The crust oaks, you can't get away without getting the substrate to the folios are the leafy ones and fruticose are bushy. And of course there's always a few kind of in between things like a folios lichen that's really hard to get off the substrate but it's... Um, yeah the folios <laughs> just, be, just because we say crustose is hard doesn't mean folios isn't really hard. Now here's a shape of uh, some the uh, layering of it this would be a typical Folios cross section. The top is the cortex. It's kind of like <laughs> your bark. It contains it. So the out, the, oh, me. so oh. the entire plant is called a a thallus. Okay. So each each uh, section, the, the thallus will have various lobes on it typically, but uh, but again, yeah, it'll have an upper cortex on the thallus. Yeah, and the marrow of it. These all these are all hyphal threads of the fungal component. That's the medulla and then the lower cortex, and not all uh, folios have lower cortex, but most of them do. So the uh, the, the uh, cortex also consists of the fungal hyphae, but they exude some kind of gelatinous material that makes for a, um, a much harder, more uh, dense... Yeah, uh, more concentrated. ...covering. So they're all actually part of the fungus. And then you see here the uh, algal layer is layer... Uh, uh, arrayed toward the top to kind of take advantage of the sunlight for <clears throat> photosynthesis. And the rhizines, kind of word that's related to roots, those can help hold <clears throat> on to the substrate. So the rhizines are, uh, <clears throat> they're also useful for identification. Sometimes the rhizines are branched, sometimes they're forked. Uh, sometimes they're a different color. For instance, they may be a sort of a whitish color as opposed to black. 
So, uh, <clears throat> however, sometimes they're hard to see because you can't, it's not always easy to see the underside of, of, the, of the lower cortex, but. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we slice through these and find out some things, drop some chemicals on there and see what happens. And now here is the algal layer. This one's really clear in this particular uh, lichen. <clears throat> so you can see how it's kind of up there toward the top. <clears throat> and uh, the two kinds of algae that are in there, one isn't really an algae, it's cyanobacteria, but I say like we old guys once called that blue green algae, but they have green algae. So I say this cyanobacteria is nostoc, this mm. green algae is trabuchia, trabuxia. Those are very common. And so most of the uh, most of the uh, ones that we'll see, the lichens that we'll see, uh, have green algae in them. So they're they're more common around here at least. <clears throat> so uh, oh yeah, this is a picture showing. Well, I'll just go back. This, uh, that top layer of fungus that's the cortex protects the algae from ultraviolet light, which would really kill algae. In, in bodies of water, algae often have ways to get low enough so that they don't get killed. They stay high enough in the water so they can photosynthesize and low enough so they don't get killed. And that grayness that you see when you walk through a, a woods or on the edge of a woods on a sunny day, when it rains, it clarifies and that allows all the sunlight to go right through to the algae, but it's under cloud, so it doesn't have as much ultraviolet. So uh, Bob Clips was kind enough to take this picture for us before and after. So he set up his camera and uh, Got the dry picture and then sprayed the thing and a special request special request image <laughs> and here's the news which you all have probably heard of it uh a guy named tony sabrilli lived in uh, montana and i think his his family maybe were kind of those militants with uh submachine guns and stuff like that but he got into uh lichen so anybody can get into lichen and he sent in some lichen samples of two different kinds of lichen and he got back from the lab that he paid to identify him or analyze him he said these are the same <laughs> he said like 12 15 and 13 12 are the same ones and he said no one's orange and one's green and that's when he found out that they can also have uh, other other uh, basidiomycete uh, <laughs> yeast. Usually yeast is an ascomycete, but uh, they do have uh, some basidiomycete yeast that can get in there and they can have double uh, examples of uh, algae in there too. So it's quite a complicated uh, ecosystem. So this might be a good time to point out that actually lichens have no names. This might come as a surprise. There are a lot of odd kind of unusual things about lichens, but one of those things is that they don't really have a name. Uh, the names that we've been giving you are the names of the lichenized fungus. So uh, again, it, it makes the names make no reference to the, to the algae that's in, the kind of algae that's uh, contained in it. And this is what happened in this case. It was uh, the identical fungus um, and actually the same algae, I think, but apparently it, it, it contained a yeast also, which um, made it a different species. However, um, the basic dogma is that it's just a, it's a, a fungus and an, an alga, and that's it. So this is kind of throwing everything off, um, even though many people have speculated that bacterial uh, um, substances uh, are also part of the the lichen network, as you as they might say. So, yeah, they're complicated. <laughs> and the one one reason he knew he sent in the green one, I believe that he sent in was sometimes used in soups by the Native Americans, and the orange one was known to be toxic, so they didn't bother with that. So he he was pretty clear they were different. Now we're getting to the Isidia, <laughs> which we have. Yeah have been mentioning. Yes. 
<clears throat> this is our how lichen spread and there can be a rupture on the surface. That's the top one, a rupture. And there's little crumbs that are in there. They're, it's pretty obvious the crumbs are in there that you can see they have little algal cells in them. And they also have some little bits of fungal hyphae. So they go out and alight in various areas and they just take the, the luck. They, they go out in big numbers and that's how they do it. And that one combines all the components on that little part. So those uh, those breaks in the surface might be like pom poms on the top surface, or they might be along the edge. Again, there's different uh, patterns uh, that you would see. So that's and that's a clue to identification, differentiating different species is how those ceridia are arranged. And ceridia <laughs> that comes from a word that means uh, uh, a heap. A heap. A soros so, is the heap. Soros is a heap, and then. Isidia, like Jim said, it's named after a kind of coral. Mm. And you can see in this illustration, that's the cortex, that black line. So it goes all the way up and encompasses each of those. And, and they break off uh, readily and they can mm. get dispersed around. Mm. So these are the two features that come up most often in identification. So a uh, key will ask, you know, does it have ceridia or does it have isidia? So a lot of times in the same genus, you know, some will be some, some will be others. Uh, some, some lichens don't have either feature on them. <clears throat> and there are also a few other features that we're not going to mention there or too much because they're, they're less common. But these, those two, ceridia and isidia, come up all the time uh, when you're trying to make an identification. Sometimes it's clear cut, but it can get very, very <clears throat> hard to... Uh, realize which one it is. Usually at some of our meetings, we'll, we'll <laughs> stare at something and we'll, then we'll go up to Ray and we'll go, Ray, are, are these Isidia? And he'll go, well, what do you think? <laughs> and and you, you may have like 50-50 chance. Uh, <laughs> if you had to ask, it's not easy, but I guess it gets easier. But in one case, I was going through the key and I happened to notice in one instance, it mentions Isidiate soridia, so I'm not really sure what exactly that. I guess if you can't decide, then that's what it is. But one good trick for, uh, again, if you're having trouble uh, distinguishing between the two, which does happen a lot, uh, the best way is just to kind of look around the whole thallus because you'll see at some point you'll see something that really looks like an Isidia. So in that case, it's it's definitely the Isidia because they, they won't have both. It'll be either or. Um, so just kind of look around, but again, sometimes it's, it's not easy to, to tell what the what the color is. And uh, in the bottom one is strictly a fungal reproductive structure. Now this one is is uh, fungal sexual reproduction. It's an apothecium, which a word that means a storehouse. All those things that looks like little tasty donuts or pancakes and stuff. Those are apothecia, and they have those typical uh, little fungal containers that shoot spores out and then they have to get lucky once they're out and get connected with the right uh, algae when they're out there, which sometimes they wait around with a algae that they're dating, but they don't actually find the one that makes the, the lichen until later, but they can you know, wait it out apparently for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Here is a Soridia illustration. Those are little piles of those little crumbs, like in the drawing. So that's Fissia americana. And here's some more Ceridia. These are kind of arrayed out on the very edges of the thallus. And this one's in the Maumee State Forest, like the only big tree right across from the headquarters of the Maumee State Forest. Do you yeah. remember what the name of this? Yeah, it's uh, Flavopunctelia ceridica. Uh oh, so our internet connection just got unstable. So it's been nice talking if no. anything happens. <laughs> but uh, what did you say it was again, Jim? Uh, Flavopunctelia ceridica. Flavopunctelia. Punctelia. All right. And then here we're back to the Isidia. Sometimes when you have the Isidia look, they look like little blackheads to me. So that's something else. And here we're back to the apothecia, and these are strictly fungal reproductive bodies. And these look so tasty to me, like little tarts. So notice here that, again, the rim of the uh, apothecia is the same color as the thallus, 
but the inside is kind of a darker or different color. So, but once in some species, uh, they'll both be the same color. So that's kind of just another minor feature to, to look at, but it's, it's useful for identifying. Yeah, sometimes they ask that. And in this, just a, a little more to illustrate the idea. <laughs> so two, two types. Two different kinds. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture I took. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the fired out lichen. You're very likely to see this on your sidewalk or your curb or something when you, you see these little orange dots. Uh, that's the fired out lichen. It is just pretty much everywhere. So, so <laughs> very common. No, oh, yeah. Here's a review. Soria are the crumbs, Isidia are the little fingers, and Apothecium are the little tarts. Mm -hmm. And here's another feature. <laughs> the cilia are like little eye eyelashes there. So there are not too many kinds that have the cilia. This one is a Parmotrema, which is called a ruffle lichen. And that's, that's a halfway decent common name, I admit. But uh, again, that has common, uh, has most of the species have uh, these cilia. Eyelashes kind Parmo of. Parmotrema hypotropium. And see how it's white on the back? I'm not sure that it has a uh, cortex on the underside. I think it's a light cortex. I think, you a think it is a cortex. One, yeah. So it is cortex, but a different color than the top cortex. <clears throat> Here's another feature called pseudocyphaly. Um, unfortunately, I guess, I wish they would have picked a little bit shorter name for this one, but uh, anyhow, they didn't. So. These are just breaks in the surface. Now they don't have ceridia uh, coming out of them, but they're just a white spots. This is a really common one called uh, Punctilia rudecta. And again, this shows it wet, so it looks kind of green. It's often a sort of a light pale green, but it's very common. It grows uh, pretty large, several, uh, several inches across on tree trunks. So it's really one that you'll commonly see. This one here has a red medulla. So <laughs> if you go up and scrape it and so it's that kind of brownish gray color and you get suspicious and you scrape it with your fingernail or a little knife and you get that pretty red that's what rubric pulchra means so in most cases in most species the the medulla again the fungal hyphae inside are white um, so again this is really stands out there's a couple that have sort of yellowish one but this uh orange red one is is uh very, it's very common. It's quite small. Probably they're only about, you know, less than an inch across here, the ones we're looking at. But typically there will be something broken off on them and you can see that little bit of orange. So it's a, it's a giveaway for them. Can you tell I'm trying to push Jim oh, a yeah. little bit? <laughs> <laughs> this is another shot of Candelaria concolor. When you get in, it looks just like a yellow smear on a tree, but when you get in close, it's just amazingly <laughs> Really. And it has ceridia around the edges. Oh, ceridia. Yep. Those are ceridia. Yeah. It's a little bit out of focus. And this is Xantho Mendoza. So you got to see this one. It's so fun to say. You're going to see it's a little orangier. And I think I got a comparison <laughs> one coming up. No, maybe not. But I'll just go back. <laughs> that one's a yellowish green. It's very common. This is an orange. This is pretty common too. It's uh. But again, uh, the, this is much larger. They're probably an inch or two across, and it's uh, but it's really strikingly orange. So you can there are several species, but they're all all of those are orange. <laughs> this one here, the Parmelia sulcata, they call it that one, the hammered shield like, and it's like if you uh, pound it with a with your metalworking hammer, you get those ridges in it. So that's why they call it that, and. Uh, that is good on determining what one that is. And notice there's some ceridia on that along ceridia. the edges or in some of the cracks here and there, so. In my experience, I find the ceridia much more frequently than the mm -hmm. isidia. This one also has some openings with ceridia in it. Hammered shield like and again. And I don't know what this one is. We're not sure, but it's a good picture of some ceridia, so <laughs> we had to put that in there. <clears throat> Peltigera, a soil. This is a soil lichen. Often grows among mosses. There's uh, I've seen some on the uh, cross country ski trail at uh, Oak Openings Park, and also there's quite a bit. There's, there's several uh, areas of it at uh, Sawyer Quarry. If you uh, if you come from the parking lot and kind of look over the quarry and go to your left a little ways. Uh, right around the rim, 
you'll find there's some areas with a lot of moss, but it has this uh, has one of the peltigera species, and this is the one that uh, one of the uh, species that has uh, blue green algae or oops, excuse me cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria. Hey, we know what you mean. <laughs> These are ones we really don't see very much in uh, Northwest Ohio. The, they demand a higher air quality, so uh, but. Uh, these are the usmias. I forget what they call these ones. They have a general name. Oh, beard lichens, beard. I believe, is it? Yeah, that, that makes sense. So they're very nice. There's quite a few, but they're again, they're definitely an indicator of good air quality. So we don't. We're still uh, trying. Not likely to see them here. Pedonia orangiparina. We do have some of that in the Oak Openings Park. I know for sure mm -hmm. we have that at the Kitty. Todd Preserve. And grows on soil. Mm -hmm. Down at, oh, in the lower left, you can see some little uh, pixie cup lichens uh, in there too. So both of those are the soil, soil types. Well, this is just a nice uh, <laughs> ramalina. It means kind of like a antlers. So that's kind of an antler one. Uh, the gray one with all the apothecia, I don't know what that Probably one is. Probably aphysia or something, or it's, we're not quite sure. But maybe, maybe at the very bottom, a little bit of the uh, Parmela sulcata. But notice on the Ramalina, which is, you know, the light green one, uh, does have quite a few apothecia on it. So there's a large one kind of down toward the bottom. But if you if you look at the uh, around on the thallus, you'll see it does have some apothecia on this. So well, I believe it's Ramalina americana. And I think that was from the wilds down by Zanesville where we got that picture. Yeah, that could be. I believe. I haven't seen it around here. Here's one we got in Michigan. Uh, uh, I think a lot. Uh, we got at St. Ignace up in the Upper Peninsula, just barely along a little wet creek. It was a really a wet area. There was more than one of these on on uh, trees leading over the stream. So this is a long work. You won't get this in Ohio. I mean, if you do, you're going to get a Pulitzer Prize or something like that. So there are scattered reports from before 1900. Uh, some from Cleveland, some from uh, uh, all around, really scattered areas in Ohio. There was even one collection, 1900, from Grand Rapids, Ohio. And uh, here's an old picture of it from 1597. You see, they changed the category a little bit. Muscus pulmonarius monstrosus. These would grow on trees, and they're, nothing kills the tree and nothing kills the lichen. They get gigantic. And a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah, what are they going to eat? Oops, I'm on the screen there. Yeah, uh, these are where the algae are arrayed toward the top, and that's what the fungal component gets its nutrition from. So here are a sketch of fungal hostoria, they're called those <laughs> little bulbous things. So this is a microscopic view here, obviously. This is, this is what Beatrix Potter saw, and these would be a uh, typical uh, sap probe or parasitic uh, fungal things that she drew. And the Hostoria, if you'll see like in seven there, they're starting to grow in near the algal cells, and they go right in to the cell, like punching your hand inside of a balloon, but the balloon doesn't pop, it just gets real thin. And that's where they start getting the sugars out of the algae and they provide uh, some nutritional components to the algae too. So that was kind of controversy. Uh, uh, I think it was si Simon Schwendener in <laughs> about 1840 said like, those were called before when I showed you the picture of them right at the top. The researchers didn't know what they were in the late 1790s and early 1800s. They called them gonidia because they thought must be maybe reproduction, but they sure looked like algae. And then in in the 1840s, Simon Schwindener said, you know, these are algae. They just look exactly like trabusia. And everybody got furious in an uproar. And part of the problem was he only had a word for parasitism. And they could not believe that the fungus was parasitizing algae in there because those things were 
so plump and green, they said that is not a sign of a parasitized uh, species. So they didn't have a word for any kind of sharing or equal benefit or anything like that. And like a lot of things in research, when you have a completely new and outrageous finding, you fi finally change everybody's mind when, when the last specialist before you finally dies, mm -hmm. then then it's uh, accepted that those were algae. Yeah, the controversy lasted about seven years. I think the last algae denier uh, published a, a, a paper in the 1930s. So that was apparently <laughs> the end of it, finally. 1930s, they decided they are algae. So uh, here's just uh, some of what we've talked about. And then we're going to kind of get into any kind of discussion or if you want to look at anything are substrates. Substrates have to be something that stands still. Uh, lichen are one of the first uh, kind of growth forms that came out of the ocean. So they probably started first on rocks because there weren't any trees at that point. So it has to be something that doesn't move or get eroded away easily. They have various shapes that they adapt to and we talked about the different uh, arrangement of the tissues. So I think we're, we're kind of on where we can open it up. So I don't know if I unshare or stop sharing screen or what. All right, uh, if you can hear me. Yes. Thanks very much. Um, we have a few questions from the audience of 35 people. Um, and Marie, I'm going to open you up. You want to ask about the uh, the scope uh, question? Hang on a second. If you're not shy, go ahead and uh, ask about the scope that they were using. Oh yeah, I just wanted to know what kind of her, scope her are question the was: What type of scope are the people in the pictures using to look at the lichen? That is a hand lens. <laughs> And uh, they call them hand lenses, or you could call them loops, L-O-U-P-E. And so I think, I think you would look under hand lens if you're looking for one on the internet. And they range from about $15 up to about $150. They have really nice ones now with little lights inside. Those LEDs just uh, provide a... Uh, great uh, illumination when you're out in the woods. So, because you get that magnification, they get dark. So that's basically what it is. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Great. You know, we had uh, John Zabowski got a question. Okay. About, and so I'm gonna open up the mic to John. Hi, Jim and Janet. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, great presentation. So, oh, thanks. Yeah. I wonder what could we do to help promote lichens and mosses in our yards and gardens? Is there anything we can do to help promote them? Well, the, like what we do around here is not wash off the outside of our gutters. So that's not a very good solution. <laughs> it just makes you unpopular in your neighborhood. Uh, they do like to get on old paints or boat covers and stuff like that. So you could set rocks, I guess. Different kinds of rocks, like put a, you know, maybe a granite, uh, depending on if you want to put a few rocks in your landscape, some granite, some uh, some limestone, a couple different things, you'll get different. They would definitely find that in uh, places, and I've seen studies uh, from grad students, say, in Maine or something. There is a like, I don't know what's a something geometricus, I forget which one that is. And geologists will age from when a glacier has retreated from an area by how large the geometricus has grown because it has a real reliable growth rate. And they just see how big it is and they'll say, well, the glacier's been away from here for 800 years or something like that. So if you just have something and it doesn't move, that is the main thing for lichens. Yeah, so a typical growth rate is about two to uh, up to maybe 10 millimeters a year. 10 millimeters, I think, for some of the earlier 
early years of some of those large uh, shield lichens, but so it's just a couple of millimeters a year typically. So planting but, fruit trees is a good way to get lichen. It seems <laughs> like there's something about the bark of of a lot of the fruit trees that that lichens really like. I think they get just a tiny bit of something that the that the fungus must dissolve from the bark and makes it really productive. So yeah, just a variety of substrates is the definitely the best way. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm going to try something. We had a comment about people uh, being able to discuss with each other. So uh, I thought that was a good point in terms of our process. So just for fun, and uh, I can undo this, Jim and Janet, quickly. Okay. I'll open up uh, mics for anybody else that has questions or, or comments. Let's all right. See what happens. Sounds good. I'm asking all to unmute. <laughs> if anyone, if you, if you can be orderly, but if anyone would like to jump in, raise your hand uh, and talk to Jim and Janet, go ahead. So All right, just, um, this is Barry. I have a, a question. What kind of camera lens do people use to take those pictures? Well, the good ones they use, uh, I think it was uh, called Step or Stage, JG Photography, stack, where, stack. Stacked, where they take one at one millimeter, one at two millimeters, one at three millimeters, then they bring it back and use software to take the sharpest focuses and put them together. So it looks completely focused that way. And the ones I take, you could pick them out from 50 feet away on this presentation that they only focus on a real narrow range. So they do use nice cameras. But you know, Ian Adams, uh, the photographer, he teaches a class uh, typically, I think at the Seacrest Arboretum on using your iPhone. He teaches a whole class of uh, lichen photography. And I believe, I'm pretty sure on our, website, ohiomosslichen.org, hmm. and has, uh, I believe, a slideshow that he uses for how to, with some ideas about how to use a, an iPhone for yeah. taking lichen pictures. And he's obviously very successful. That one it. is ohiomosslichen.org. It has all sorts of resources. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, Ian's definitely, uh, uh, Ian and Bob Clips are definitely great sources for uh, uh, for camera ideas, but Ian was really very, uh, very uh, approving and very enthusiastic about the iPhone. He says he doesn't even carry his big heavy cameras very much ever anymore because he can do everything he wants to without it. But Bob, yeah, he carries around all that hey, stuff Dave. and lies in front of a like and for 15 minutes. Still working on, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm listening to a lecture. You're not just listening, you're on it. <laughs> if you have a question, jump in. And if you don't, you can mute your mic. This is uh, Tammy. I have a question about um, uh, keys or printed uh, guides or sources to use to help identify these. Mm -hmm. Well, a good one is, you probably can't see it real well, but this is the ODNR booklet about lichens. You, it's free. Hey, Jim, could you stop yeah. sharing for just a moment? And we'll see, we'll get a good video. Yeah, we do. Okay, now, oh, okay. now put it there. Let's... Wait, no, I used to stop sharing, but I, wait, I got to go yeah. like this. Yeah, she'll get that down. <laughs> yeah, this is a free publication. You can get it. Uh, we'll show you in a second. But it... Uh, there. I, yeah, I've got that one. Oh, okay. That's really a good one to start with. Um, as far as keys go, um, the Macro Lichens of Ohio is um, a book by Ray Showman and Don Flanagan. And uh, this one, um, again, this has a description of each species. They have revised the keys, and that's available for free on our uh, ohiomosslichen.org uh, website. They've revised some of the names that have, have changed on it. So again, you can get this. Uh, this is available from the Ohio but, uh, Biological Society. Hi. And uh, Where are they? You have the big as black one? far as that's a good one oh, for I'll keys. Ohio Biological Survey, I bet you not society. Oh, that's it. That's right. You're right. 
then there's this giant lichen book by Stephen Sharnoff, um, which contains just all kinds of Bruno. wonderful, Erwin Brono, and uh, it's just, it's so heavy you can't read it while you're lying down because it'll suffocate you. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> there uh, it is. Everything's back. <laughs> You right. got the idea, lichens. But it's an excellent one. Of course, it covers all of North America, so it's a bit um, a wonderful book, and not all that expensive for such a huge, a huge book. So. Erwin Brodo, that this expert is still alive, but he's a such a such a lichen lover uh. that he just looked for a grant where he could publish this amazing book at a price that people could afford because he knew when when people saw the book they were going to love lichen and <laughs> it's right they 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 uh started loving them in Ohio and asking people like us to give talks about it so Irvin Brodo was right great thank you mm -hmm. Anybody else? That sounds like we're winding up. <laughs> well, great. Well, I'll hand it over to Barry. Barry, uh, I'm about to ask you to uh, go on to uh, video. Actually, okay. John, one last quick thing, if I could. Uh, yeah. Anybody's welcome to send us photos. They have our email uh, address. Uh, we can at least take a guess if you're if you're trying to identify something, or can send us a, send us a specimen even. But definitely send us your photos if uh, we'll Sweet. take a look. Why don't you uh, can you share that again? The last slide. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, oh, the slide now. Yeah. Yeah, I got to go down to share screen. <laughs> it's jtoppin at frontier .com, So we'll. Oh, there it is down at the bottom. Jay Toppin at Frontier.com. Yeah, so we have people send us. Uh, and also you can put up your photos on iNaturalist. Uh, there's a couple really good Ohio uh, lichenologists that check that all the time, and they, they can definitely give you some. Uh, I, don't, I haven't used it too much. but uh, If you put on a lichen, there will be uh, a, an Ohioan name. Curtis. Tom, 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 oh, Tomas Curtis. Tomas Curtis. And he's, he's got it down cold. Yeah, he's a sophomore at Kent State, I think, but he's really, uh, really into it. So, so those are. Oh my gosh! Like <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it, uh, Jim and Janet, and well, uh, enjoyed your program. I want well, to thank. I talk to you. <laughs> okay. I want to thank everyone for being involved and participating tonight. Uh, we will look forward to you at the November 19th banquet, and you can look for more information on that on the uh, TNA website and in our newsletter. I think without any further ado, I believe we are probably done.